Rodney, you've written some of the biggest, the biggest hits, certainly within, within my lifetime and everyone else's is, is here. Uh, could you just list some of the artists that you've worked with? Probably your, your, top, your top five artists that, of people that you've worked with. <coughs> top Which five. I know is difficult. Yeah, yeah. I would have to say um, Brandy. Um, Whitney Houston. Beyonce. It's tough. <laughs> um, I want to say um, probably Destiny's Child and Michael Jackson. Wow. Tony Braxton. <laughs> Sam Smith. <laughs> Spice Girls, SZA, Her. <laughs> Sorry, it was just five. Uh, I couldn't stop, couldn't help myself. Yeah, five was mean. Five was mean. Yeah. Uh, I kind of just want to get straight, straight into it. Uh, the Boy Is Mine, one of the, one of the great records. Uh, tell us how you, how you wrote that. The first number one. First number one. Um, it was crazy. I was living with my parents. Um, was I living with my parents? No, actually, I think, uh, yeah, I think I still was living with my, yeah, I was living with my parents. And um, I was in the basement. And the basement was something about having nothing. Like, when you don't have nothing, you, you can appreciate life a little bit more creatively. And um, I would be in that basement with, like, wires all over the place. I used to sleep on the pool table in the basement or the bean bag, whatever I could, you know. It, it wasn't about a bedroom for me, it was about staying close to the studio. And I sat down one day and I just, I found like this harp sound that was on like, you know those pianos, those electric pianos that you mostly everybody has where it has like an organ sound, a harpsichord sound. It was one of those, it had a harp. My dad had one of those in the house and I, I went to the harp sound and I started going, doing the arpeggios breaking up a chord, and my dad was like, what is that? I was like, I don't know. I never know what I create, I just create. And so he started recording me, mm. and then I went and turned it into a tune. And is that because of your, your love of church music growing up and yeah. classical music? Yeah, I was classically trained for eight years. And my mom said that um, the teacher said he couldn't teach me anymore. He said, because I was going too fast. And I always, every time he'd come over to the house to teach me, by the time I turned 13, I would be like, let me play what I wrote. He's like, no, I want you to play for Elise. I was like, yeah, okay, -na 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 -na. but listen to this. <laughs> and, uh, and so he's like, I can't teach this kid anymore. He's, <laughs> I just wanted to write. I just wanted to write at that point. And what, how did you distinguish yourself from being uh, a producer rather than an artist? I mean, you are an artist in your own right. I was 10 years old. But 10 years old, believe it or not, I was 10 years old. My brother was seven years older than me, and um, he produced a lot of local groups, and he never let me into his studio or touch anything. So I was like, okay, one day you're gonna see what it is. <laughs> and, um, but what I do, what I, I, would, I would hear sounds. I would hear sounds, and I get really inspired by all these beautiful sounds. And I'm like, that's what I wanna do. What is, what is that called? And they say, production. I was like, that's what I wanna do, I wanna produce. And, um, and then I would just, that's what I would do. I would take sounds that I hear and turn it into songs. And the crazy thing about it is sounds, if, you if you're really quiet, there's a sound. It's coming from way over there. It's a tone. There's tones everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we take those tones and we turn them into unique productions. It's funny, uh, a friend of mine, Bruno Major, he does these things which he thought would have been quite boring to his followers, but he has this thing called, there's music and everything. And he'll record like a train door or like whatever, and he'll actually go over to the piano and then find the chord. You'd love it. <laughs> hey, when I was working with Michael, and Michael, he said, I'm so sick of these primitive sounds. 
every sound sounds like the same. The snares all sound the same. The kicks sound the same. I'm so sick of it. Rodney, go find me some unique new sounds. And I was like, well, how do I do that? He's like, go to the junkyard and hit things. I swear on everything I love. I go to the junkyard with a DAT recorder, and I just start hitting all types of things. And the funny thing is, that was in 1999. That carried on with me throughout my whole career. I came to London in 2000, and probably when I saw you, it was like 15 or 16, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And I was working with this incredible songwriter, his name is Sam Romans. Mm -hmm. And he came into the studio, he's like, all right, so what are you gonna write today? I said, well, first, let's go into the garage. <laughs> We're at Metropolis Studios, and we went into the garage, and I said, let's just hit everything that's in there. And so we just started taking things and hitting them, and hitting them, and literally <laughs> stomping, and the dust was flying all over the place, but we created a whole song around sounds inside the Metropolis garage. Amazing. Yeah. And was it number one? <laughs> no, <Nah>, like <laughs> 1,000, but no. <laughs> no, it never came out, actually. Those, uh, are the, those are the best ones, by the one. The ones that never came out, those are some of the best ones. And this is what this event tonight's all about. It's all about best hearing those un, these uncut gems. Um, yeah. t tell us the story about, about Teddy Riley, because it's a great story. Teddy Riley. So Teddy Riley, you guys know who Teddy Riley is? Yeah. He's one of the best producers of all time. And um, he invented New Jack Swing. And I was obsessed as a 9, 10-year-old, 11-year-old listening to New Jack Swing. And by the time I turned 13, there was a local band, three guys, they were a group, and I got hired to do their demo. $25 a song. And I did, proud of that $25 a song, proud. I did their demo, and somehow their demo got played for Teddy Riley. He was in Atlantic City, that's where I was born and raised. He was in Atlantic City, and they played the demo for him. And he told the group, he goes, I'm not really into you guys, <laughs> but whoever did this track is really good. And their manager got on a payphone and called me and was like, yo, Teddy said your track is really good. I was like, what? What do you mean? Where is he? He's like, he left. He left. So I, I told my dad, I said, dad, I was like, we got to go to Virginia Beach. And my dad's like, why do we have to go to Virginia Beach? I said, because if you look on the back of this album, it says Teddy Riley Studios in Virginia Beach. So we got to go right now. And my dad was like, that's like a six and a half hour drive. I was like, no, it's five and a half, but we got to go. And so my dad was like, we're not going to Virginia Beach. And I said, you always said strike when the iron is hot. The iron can never be this hot. We got to go. I was a very pushy little kid. You probably, all, all you would have hated me. Just saying. So, but I pushed him and pushed him and he said, okay, we can go. We went to Virginia Beach, not knowing if he was, if he was gonna even be there. And we get to the studio, his studio, and it was nobody there. Nobody in the parking lot, completely empty. We waited and we waited and we waited hours, no one was there, waited. My dad was like, see, I told you this was gonna happen. He's probably on tour somewhere. I was like, dad, no, he's gonna be here, just trust me. And about three, four hours later, sitting in the parking lot in my dad's church van, and here comes this convertible Mercedes driving up. And I was like, that's Teddy. That's Teddy Riley. And I got out the car and I went to go, and his security said, hold back, kid. And then finally they let me in the studio, and I pressed play for Teddy. I played nine tracks for that, that day for Teddy. He let me play nine tracks, now think about it. Wow. That's such a blessing, wow. yeah. right? He let me play nine tracks, and he said, I'm going to take you to meet Michael Jackson someday. I was only like 13 and a half, 14 years old. Wow. And I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Fast forward three years. Well, I got a chance to like intern for Teddy. I got a chance to be around him and learn and just take it all in. And then one night, I'm in Virginia Beach. I'm probably like 17 now, 18. And he goes, hey, get in the car. We're leaving. We're going to New York. And I didn't know why we were going to New York. I just know we were going to New York. And I'm in a van with Teddy, and he's playing Michael Jackson the whole trip to New York. Six hour drive. And I said, I'm about to meet Michael Jackson. This is happening. Because as a producer, you study, even if you work with the, with the artist, you keep listening to the artist when you're gonna work with them again. So I, was, I, so I knew like, okay, Teddy's listening to Michael for a reason. And we get to New York, like two o'clock in the morning, and I check in and he calls me in the room, he says, come down little brother. And I come down and he takes me down the street, I meet Michael Jackson. And then I looked at Michael and I said, I'm gonna work with you someday. <laughs> and, I, and Michael said, really? You really think so? I said, I know so. And four years later, I was working with Michael. 
Wow. The gift that keeps on giving. Well, that's a story of, yeah. of persistence yeah. and grinding yeah. and just being so confident. Where did you get your confidence from? Your you, belief. If you don't believe in you, who else will? Right? You know, I, I, I know I have a guy giving gifts, and I know God believes in me, and I know if, if, I, if I don't believe in myself, then you're not going to convince anybody else that you will, right? And it was a similar thing with, with, with Whitney as well. I mean, talk about your relationship with Clive Davis. By the way, Whitney's movie is coming out the end of this month. I'm the executive producer of the music on the film and as well as the soundtrack. Little plug. Naomi, Naomi, Naomi Aki from London is, plays Whitney. It's a really good, really good film. Um, but Whitney turned into a really incredible film, a uh, friend of mine. Because um, she was, Clyde was trying to get her to do this album. She didn't want to do a studio album. She had, she had worked in, she had did a studio album in eight years. And she came to his hotel room one night and said, you got anything for me to hear? He was kind of shocked. And he said, actually, I met with this kid this morning. He played me, it's not right, but it's, and, uh, and uh, all I know is I was in the studio like two weeks later with Whitney. And we did that, then we did If I Told You That with her and George Michael and a um, couple other tunes. And then she came to my church and sang at my dad's church. Wow. Which, has, which holds like 50 people. There's more people in this room right now than my dad's church has. Wow. Seriously. And um, so we just grew this bond, you know, friendship. Uh, I miss her dearly. She, she's one of the greatest voices I've ever worked with. Yeah. Yeah. You've worked with so many great, great voices. What does it take for you to work with a great voice? Obviously, at the beginning, you know, you, you're drawn to, to new voices, but, but now you have a choice of people to work, work with. How do you choose? Man, I, you know, sometimes it's, it's the tone that gets me. I listen for the tone, like, like, like Ray, right? Like, Ray is different. Ray is special. That's a unique, special, gifted person. You guys better take heed to what that is. Because when someone can play and sing like that, I got a chance to work with her this weekend. So I work with a lot of people. She's special. Tones. Definitely. Definitely. Tones. 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 It doesn't matter what the tone is. It can be rich. It can be thin. It doesn't matter. But if it's distinctive. That's what I love. I'm looking for a distinctive, something that has a character in it. And that's always, you know, and I, it's funny because when I, I guess when I'm working on music, like if I hear a certain tone, I kind of can know ahead of time, this is going to be a, a good session. Mm -hmm. Like, just like, I just got an instinct about it. Yeah. How did Say My Name come about? Obviously, <laughs> a massive, massive, favorite, massive hit. My favorite production, probably. Really? Um, Why? Because of the story. You ready for this? So, yes. I'm a great storyteller, I must admit. <laughs> I'm a, it's part of songwriting, right? No, I was in London and I was working on another great song called Holla Holla with Spice Girls. And before I left London, Spice Girls took me to a club. And I went to this club and I heard a sound that I'd never heard before in the States. It was like a garage two step rhythm. And I never heard that. I'm also a drummer, so I was like really just fascinated by the sound. And I asked the DJ if he could make me a CD. Mm. And he made me a CD, and I studied that sound all the way back to the States. Mm. My first session back in the States was with Destiny's Child. When I got back to the States to work with Destiny's Child, um, <laughs> I played this beat, and they hated it. But I knew the song was great. And this is for anybody that's a producer in the room, songwriter. This is very important. Judge the song. If the song is great, it can live in any type of production space. That's why we have remixes. That's why songs live extra lives. So even though everybody hated it, I knew there was something in the song. The track was horrible, mm -hmm. right? And I had to. And I didn't, you know, I told everybody, I was like, you guys are crazy. This is like the greatest track ever. You guys are just not used to it because you're not from London. <laughs> and 
fast forward to the mix down, we get to the mix session and my engineer, John Marie Horvat, is getting ready to mix it and I walk in the studio and I listen to it after living with it for like two weeks and I, and I said, this track sucks. And he turned around and said, what? I said, now I know what they're talking about. It's terrible. I was like, get rid of everything. All I want to hear is their vocals. And I started from scratch and I redid the track and that became a nine million seller. My first plat, my first Grammy. Yeah. Um, it's probably arguably one of the biggest songs of not only my career, but their career as well. And um, it's, it's just the greatest love story ever. <laughs> say wow. my name, say my name. And if you don't know how, and if you don't, if you don't know how to say my name, I'm gonna say it for you. It goes like this, Dark Child Nine Nine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you touched on something really interesting and something which I know, um, uh, I know worked well for you. And for the producers in the room, they think this is really, really interesting, which is remixes. Because when you started out in your career, you used remixes. So good, Alice. You do a lot of great research. As a way to, to, to get heard, to turn a great song into a better song. That wasn't, that, by the way, that was not my idea. That was my father's idea. My father, you know, when you're trying to get in the industry, it's, it's not the easiest industry to get in, especially when you're a teenager. They don't think you'll be able to produce vocals on certain artists. And my dad had a strategy. He, um, he would say to the executives at the labels, I remember we go to Mercury Records specifically up in New York on 49th and 8th Street. That's what Ed Eckstein was the president and Bruce Carbone was A&R. And, and my, dad was, would, my dad would say, what song are you guys about to release? And they'd be like, oh, we got this Vanessa Williams song coming out. It's just the way that you love me. He goes, won't you let my son do a remix to that? And then I would go and do the remix, and they would use my remix as the single version. So it worked once, and then it worked twice, and then it worked again and again and again. So before this is before Dark Child, actually, because I would actually talk on my remixes. I would say, another Rodney Jerkins remix, mm -hmm. right? And I would say, they said I couldn't do it again, but I did, yeah. right? And that was like my tag. I was doing producer <laughs> tags way back then, right? And, uh, but it was a strategy. And it was a way to get our foot in the door. And next thing you know, people were like calling us nonstop to do remixing. And then that's when we learned the business side of it, where we learned, OK, you could do the remix, but you're not going to get publishing, right? So you're making somebody else's song blow up, and they're going to get the benefits on the, from the publishing side of it, which didn't matter in the beginning, because we just wanted to be heard. Mm -hmm. you know? And we got heard. Mm -hmm. We did. And I think that's, uh, uh, Rodney has, has for years kind of trailblazed uh, as a kind of business entrepreneur and actually fighting for songwriters and producers' rights. Um, do you want to tell everyone about what you did with the production fee in particular that I think is particularly poignant? Well, I just, you know, we, we it's, you know, you used, we used to hear stories about, um, producers, super producers, super producers getting however much money for a track, and we figured we would triple that. We figured like, you have to set the tone for the next generation to be able to know that they have value. And so we, would, we set a new standard in the industry when it came to producer fees. Um, and then also just, for me it was more about, that was one thing, but as I grew older, because I was still a teenager, but as I grew older, I just grew a, a real care and heart for songwriters being treated properly, producers being treated properly. And so once I start to grow and learn all the specifics of royalties, mechanical performance, all these things, I, I started seeing somewhat of lopsided situations, especially when it came to like um, in, in you know um, Pandora and YouTube and these different things. I was see like, whoa, hold on, we just had this song that came out and it's number one, but I'm opening up a check for like $280. Something's wrong here. Something's not adding up. So that's when you roll up your sleeves and you go to Capitol Hill in the States, we go to Capitol Hill and I went down to Capitol Hill and I, I pleaded my case with so many other incredible creatives with the Recording Academy. And um, we just, and I, and I was, 
I was bold enough to show them the royalties. I would literally pull the royalties out to all these different governors and senators and say, I want you guys to see this. This is what I'm fighting for. This is why we deserve more. And I, I'm, I'm super, super grateful because there has been some change in the last year. Still not right yet, no. right? But, no, absolutely not. But it's a start, right? Some, it has to be a start. You know, we're going up against a lot of, <laughs> a lot of big, big companies that are fighting back as well. But it's a start, and, um, and I'm, I'm happy to see the start happening. I'm, 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 I think in the next, like, 10 years, hopefully, there will be a, a more of an improvement Right, more. It seems like a long time. It seems like a long. It seems like a long time, but um, it's it's not that long. It's not that long it, because I think it's just little increments, right? They're not going to give us all at once. They can't do that. But they'll do little increments, and they'll keep improving. And as long as it's improving, that's all that matters. And I think it's it's. I mean, I certainly think how of how important it is to hold on to your rights because. You don't know what's around the next corner in terms of technology, in terms of the deals that have been renegotiated. Absolutely. There's so much stuff happening. Like we talk about it every day. You don't know. Like, who would ever have thought that TikTok? I mean, I don't know how it is over here. You know what I love about you guys? I love London. I really do. London just appreciates the art of music. It's not, it's just, maybe, maybe y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. But I feel like every time I come here, I get like re-energized and, and, and I get motivated and inspired because I see a, a passion for music that's organic and not always the data, right? And I respect the data, right? You don't, don't, I, I respect it. Um, but I think you know, we never knew that a platform like TikTok would be what it is, right? And these are what's cool about all these different um, companies, TikTok, Spotify, all these different companies is that they're creating more revenue streams for us. Mm. So even when it's not right here, if you start to add them all up, it's going to balance out to something better, mm -hmm. which is great for the songwriter, the producer, the artist, you know, and I really believe there's so much more to come. Like we, we're not, we're not even Completely close agree. to what's about to happen. That's why I see in like 10, 10 years. It'd be like, you'd be looking back and be like, whoa, 2022 was, what was that? <laughs> what, was tic, what was TikTok? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think we're in one of the most exciting times actually looking ahead for everyone in this room, for everyone on the lineup tonight, the kids that just starting out in your careers. I mean, hearing that from someone who's had more hits than anyone put together, who's still so energized, I think is really, really inspiring. Um, so thank you. Um, w uh, can we bring it back? Because uh, I think you wanted to show off a, a demo, perhaps. Oh, yeah. No, I want to show you the evolution of a song. Yes, and, please. And it, and it actually talks about, really, like, it proves your point, right, about you never knowing what's next and what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But I just want to take you all really quickly through a, the, the journey of a song and, wh and why a song can live on and on and on and on and on, right? So I did a song... Um, Probably, I want to say it had to be somewhere around 99, 2000. But I did a song with Tony Braxton. It was called He Wasn't Man Enough. And thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, I got a call from Ellie Reed, and he was like, we, we're in desperate need of a, a tempo for Tony, because you know, she was on a lot of ballads and ballads. And he's like, do you think you can crack the code? And I was like, yeah. So we got in the studio, and we wrote this song. And it was called I Don't Want Your Man. I don't want your man. I'm gonna play y'all the demo to I don't want your man. I want you to hear the verse, the pre, and the chorus. All right? Let's hear it. Yeah. It's a demo. Turn up a little bit. Not a bad demo, not a bad demo, guys.
Stopped it. Don't stop it. Let it play right there. When he used to be with me. Why can't you understand? If I really want him, if I want him to be, he would be. He would still be here with me. Alright, cool. So what I wanted to show you was that's a different course than he wasn't man enough for me. The pre, the melody of the pre became the chorus because when we lived with it, we felt it wasn't strong enough. It wasn't bad. I don't want your man wasn't bad, actually. It's kind of catchy, too. But it wasn't, he wasn't man enough good, right? So that demo turned into this. This. Right. Turn up. So <laughs> now, what, what makes music so special is that when you create these, I call them these little embryos, that's what they are, little tadpoles of an idea, and you birth these ideas, and you develop it, and then it grows, and then it grows, and it grows, and then the world knows about it, right? The craziest thing is that we're in 2022, and there's a song right now in 2022 that has been a number one global smash. And it's this song right here. The young guys, last us. Now everybody go to our breakfast. <laughs> similar. No, it sounds similar. <laughs> so beautiful hey. that people can take <laughs> people can bring their own perspective and the, the music can just live on and on and on and on it's a beautiful thing and uh, burn a boy by the way burn a boy you <laughs> you do tend to uh i think you had a uh, with the boy's mind you with telephone with lady gaga did you reuse some of those ideas? I used, I used <laughs> you got a good ear. <laughs> no one's ever gave me that comparison, by the way. So you got a good ear, because it was, it was definitely um, a deliberate intention to use the same exact. You've got this, time, you've got this timeless vibe going on. You well, know? you know what it was, was this was like 2000. You're talking about The Boy's Mind came out in 1998. Mm -hmm. I was working with Lady Gaga in 2008. We wrote Telephone for Britney Spears, actually. That's who we're writing it for. And when we were working on the song, um, 
I was transitioning, trying to evolve and, and do pop stuff. And, but I didn't want to just lose what I do. So I took that same harp sound that I use on so many classic records and said, okay, let me just bring it into pop. And that's where you get that same sound in the beginning of um, Telephone throughout. And then two years later, it came out with, um, with Gaga and Beyonce. It's yeah. just, it's, it's so interesting. I think, um, you know, we have some amazing producers in the room. I mean, just down here, sorry, Pete, I'm singling you out. He, he produced I Feel Love for Donna Summer and all of those amazing, amazing <laughs> hits that, that shaped dance music. And we have a man here who has shaped R&B and pop music. So, sorry, I just have to mention that. You know, we I'm, have I'm actually a little, I'm really jealous of anybody from that did dance, disco, any, I'm really jealous. Like, I would have loved, loved, I would have loved to just been part of those sessions because just the, the, it, the movement and the movement and the spirit and the music is just, was on another level. And, and that, that's what really inspired me. Those type of records is what inspired me. If you listen to, if you listen to The Boy's Mind, If You Have My Love by Jennifer Lopez, even Say My Name, if you listen to those songs back to back to back, you're going to hear Four on the Floor. Even though they're slow, you're going to hear Four on the Floor. And that was, I did that purposely because I was inspired by disco. So when I heard disco records doing Four on the Floor, even though it was fast, I know the tempo's changed in he the 90s. You created four to four. Oh, you are the one. <laughs> it is you. I owe you everything. I owe you. I'm serious. Like, I seriously, like, when, I, when, when, when tempos change and, and radio wanted, um, they wanted more mid-tempo, they wanted you to be more like this, right, groove like that, but I didn't want to lose what I heard in this. So if you listen to The Boy's Mind, even though it's a very melodic, Song is still underneath, it's still going like this the whole time. If you have my love, if you have my love, and it's still going like this to kick. Rock my world. Did you rock my world? You know you did. It's still for the floor. Because I, I wanted to somehow keep that in what I was doing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Some, what would be your advice to? Boys and girls in here. Um, study, your, study your craft, right? Study. Study the greats before you. Study the greats before you. Um, learn as much as possible of the business side. Um, because you got to protect you and your family. And as you grow, when you, when, you know, I love music. I love making music. My, my, one of my friends said the other day, he said, why do you still do this? I was like, I love it. I love it. I, it's, I just, I, I go to my hotel and I'm in the bed making music. Like, I'm just like, I love it. It's two in the morning. I got my laptop out, my little keyboard in there. I'm just going crazy. I love it. I do. I'm obsessed with it. But I think you also have to also learn fragments of the business because, you know, the business is constantly changing. So if you're thinking it's, it's, it's what it was 20 years ago, it's not. It's changing, it's evolving, and you gotta keep learning and you gotta keep growing on that front. And I, and I would tell all creatives that melody is king. Melody is king. And I say that because I realized that when I started having children, because I would hum a melody to my daughter, she couldn't comprehend, comprehend the words that I was saying, but she can comprehend the melody. And she would sing back the melody, and she was not even like six months. And she'd like, la, la, la. She'd be like, la, la, la. Like, she's singing back the melody. Now, say this Abracadabra, reach out and touch someone. And she go, look at me like I'm crazy. I say, you're going to sing this. Da, da, da. She go, da, da, da. I was like, whoa, melody is king. It's the king. If you come up with great melodies, they, they live forever. They live forever. I think we have to end there because that is so profound, yeah. so true. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Rodney. Thank you. Seriously, that is- Thank you guys. That's been a- uh, This is beautiful, by the way. I think this is the most incredible thing that you guys are doing here. The, soul, the other song is awesome. I loved all the talent that I heard tonight. You guys are super gifted, super special. Keep it up. Keep writing songs. 
you know what? Just like you, they say, eat a, what is it, an apple a day? Is that what it is? Yes. Right? No, write a song a day. <laughs> write a song a day, you'll be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up for Rodney Duckchild Jerkins. <laughs>